and this one is on fingerprints of life from the early Earth to outer space. And unfortunately, Timothy Lyons was unable to travel to Vienna. Uh, so we have Kurt Kornhauser, who is a professor of ge geomicrobiology at the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Alberta in Canada, uh, taking Tim's place. We have Emmanuel Javois, who is a professor of the geology department at the University of Liège in Belgium. And we have Lena Noack, who is a postdoc at the Royal Observatory of Belgium in Brussels. And I'll now hand over to our speakers, and then we'll open the floor for questions after all the presentations. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, I'm filling in for Tim Lyons uh, for a couple of reasons. One, I was really going to be here, and two, I'm a co-author on one of the papers that he was going to present. Now, one of the, the commonalities between the, both of the papers is it's about the evolution of oxygen in the atmosphere. And what this figure, simple figure shows here is the classic view of how oxygen rose in the atmosphere through time. So it's always been believed that oxygen was very low on Earth until about 2.5 billion years ago. And that's called the Great Oxidation Event. So very, very low atmospheric oxygen levels. Then we see a sudden rise in atmospheric oxygen around 2.5 billion years ago. Then it levels off, and then we give a, a major second rise Sometime in the late near Proterozoic, somewhere between 700 and 580 million years ago, we see a second rise. And that rise is associated with the evolution of animals. So at this point in time, animals evolve, presumably because there's enough oxygen for animals to evolve. But the question that we've been really working on to a large part is the very first jump in oxygen. From a time when there was no oxygen in the atmosphere at all, to suddenly there is some oxygen available. And as I said, the classic view always had it placed at 2.5 billion years ago. And in fact, there's a, a lot of geological evidence in support of that. When we look at the rocks, there's various features in there that tell us that oxygen becomes available after two and a half billion years ago. But if you look at those same type of rocks before that period of time, it's quite clear that there was very little oxygen around. Now, one of the interesting things about the Great Oxidation Event is that represents when we get oxygen in the atmosphere. But we have to first produce the oxygen somewhere. And it's generally believed that people, or sorry, the people, the things that produce the oxygen are these things called cyanobacteria, the blue-green algae. So they're the primary oxygen producers. So at 2.5 is the time when they've produced enough oxygen that the oxygen they were producing in the oceans was able to get into the atmosphere permanently. Now, that still leaves us with the big question of when did cyanobacteria evolve? And there's been lots of efforts at trying to time when, the, when this evolved. And we've had estimates all the way from three and a half billion years ago based on fossils, which are, a lot of people dis you know, disagree with. 2.7 billion years ago was then another benchmark, and that was based on these organic biomarkers. These are like these, these compounds which are specific to certain organisms. And it was found a few years back in 1999, it was found that there's these specific biomarkers that look like they belong to cyanobacteria 2.7. We have since, through other studies, have realized that those biomarkers are probably contamination. So that evidence is gone. So the microfossil evidence isn't really very conclusive. The biomarker evidence isn't conclusive. So we've now turned to looking at geochemical proxies in the rocks. And by doing that, what seems to be occurring is that somewhere between 2.7 2.5, we start picking up evidence that there's bacteria that, have, that use oxygen as their metabolism. So we look at these chemical sediments like banded ion formations or shales, and in those rocks we see chemical features that suggest life. So 2.7 was the benchmark up really until this year. Now what's happened is that in this paper that I'm a co-author on with Noah Plavansky is that we pushed the date for oxygen production back to 3 billion years. So obviously the significance is that we actually seem to have a fingerprint in the rock record that says at this point in time cyanobacteria existed. Now, why there then is a big delay between when cyanobacteria evolved, let's say, at 3 billion years ago, to when we start seeing evidence for it in the atmosphere at 2.5 billion years is, is one of the big questions we're now working on. What causes the delay? But at least we're at the point where we think we can start pinpointing the evolution of cyanobacteria. And as in most geochemical proxies, the way we use it is that we look for specific signatures of whether it's a concentration of a metal or whether it's the isotopes of a metal that tell us something about when oxygen was available. And what NOAA did is we looked at these rocks, which were roughly 3 billion years old from South Africa. And when you take a look at the isotopes, in this particular case, molybdenum isotopes, what we found is that there were very negative isotope fractionations, so very, like minus 2 in terms of molybdenum. Now, to put that in perspective, 
Molybdenum basically fractionates quite a lot when it adsorbs on to things like iron oxides, manganese oxides, various minerals which would have formed in the, in the water column and settled out. Now we know from fractionations from lots of experiments that you get a fractionation around minus one if the molybdenum binds onto iron oxide. The only way to really get fractionations down to minus two is if it bound to something like a manganese oxide. And that's in fact what we find with these rocks from the three billion year old stuff from South Africa is fractionations all the way down to minus two. So that implies that we must have had manganese oxides available at the time to cause that fractionation. Now, why that's really important is the only way to get manganese oxides is basically with oxygen being present. Because manganese in its dissolved state is very hard to oxidize to the solid state. It needs a reasonable amount of oxygen. And in fact, that reaction is, tends to be biologically mediated. In other words, bacteria drive that chemical reaction. So the fact is that we have this very negative molybdenum isotope fractionation tells us we probably had manganese oxides, and by extension, we must have had oxygen around at the time to give us those manganese oxides. And we confirm it, which is with this plot over here, that shows the, the degree of isotopic fractionation. So the more negative you get on the x-axis, when you look at it the, on, on the y-axis, is where we have the most manganese. In other words, the more manganese we have in our system, the greater the isotopic fractionation. So in other words, by looking at the isotopic fractionation of these rocks, we were able to discern that the only way to get such high fractionation molybdenum was by having manganese oxides around to scrub the, man the molybdenum out of the water column, and the only way to get the manganese oxides was if there was oxygen around to oxidize, dissolve manganese to those manganese oxides. Is that reasonably okay? Okay. Should I go on about Tim's or? Oh, okay, fine. Sorry, not how long I had. Okay, so cheers. <laughs> so I'm going to try to make the link between early Earth, early life, habitability on Earth, and habitability beyond Earth. So all that in a few minutes. Um, so the basic uh, messages I just summarize here in the in these slides. Uh, so the take home messages are that Earth was habitable quite early on. Life diversified, diversified quite early on Earth, although some traces are debated, but there is an agreement about 3.4 billion years ago for the first traces of life. And life today drives in a large range of physical chemical conditions. All these elements help us to define uh, what kind of biosignature we can look for to uh, reconstruct the evolution of life on early Earth, but also what kind of signature we can look for uh, on other bodies beyond Earth. It also helps us to understand what makes early Earth habitable and if we can extrapolate these conditions uh, beyond Earth. So just uh, some brief cartoons. Very early Earth was not habitable. Earth was really hot. Uh, there was an hypothesis of a magmatic ocean, so really difficult for life to appear in these conditions uh, in uh, times older than 4.3 billion years ago. Then we go quickly to a habitable early Earth. Between 4.3 and 3.8 billion years ago, there's some debate about it. We have different evidence that other scientists uh, uh, demonstrated uh, in the past about this uh, habitability. So Earth was uh, at liquid oceans, at some volcanic activities, a lot of hydrothermal activities, nutrients, and possibly life uh, appeared at that time. And then at around 3.4, we have uh, a range of evidence showing uh, that life probably diversified already by that time. So, oops, sorry. When we talk about life, uh, life on Earth is divided into three big domains, bacteria, the eukarya, and the archaea. Bacteria and archaea are prokaryotes. They have quite diversified metabolism. They colonize the whole planet everywhere, even deep on Earth. Um, but they have simple cellular architecture. Eukaryotes are nucleated cells. We are eukaryotes, but so many unicellular organisms. And they have complex cell cells, but less diversified metabolism. These three domains have a uh, common origin called LUCA, which is the last universal common ancestor. This is not the first form of life that appear on Earth. It's the last common ancestor of the three domains we know today. 
And when we try to understand the evolution of life and going back further and further in time, we can look at the genetic codes of living organism uh, existing today, or we can look at the rock record, because rocks are really great. They preserve both the evolution of Earth and the evolution of life. And that's what we uh, try to do and uh, present in the two sessions that will uh, uh, be uh, at EGU tomorrow afternoon. So what kind of signature we will be looking for in situ in the solar system? We can look, well, and of course, first on Earth. We can look for different kinds of signature. We can look at rocks that show evidence of interaction with microbes, such as stromatolites. You see every uh, modern and fossil examples. This is a 2.7 billion year old stromatolite. You can look, of course, for microfossils. Uh, these are preserved in different conditions, in uh, mud or in uh, silicified by fluids. Uh, we can look for uh, chemical evidence of life, either by uh, isotopic signals that show that there was some metabolism uh, active uh, early on, uh, like Kurt mentioned uh, briefly. And we can also look at fossil molecules that will also tell us about the diversity of life. Of course, these are... Uh, Difficult to, uh, to find, they are often microscopic signature, and there are many abiotic processes that can mimic what life does. So there are considerable debates about uh, early life uh, traces. So basically, we all go from the field to the lab and going from macro scale to micro scale. We can try to use the rock record either at uh, outcrops or in, uh, in drilling cores when the old crops are too altered. For example, in this uh, ICDP Cradle of Life project in South Africa, we have access to really nice uh, and old cores. And then we can do all kinds of studies on these rocks to know their age in one kind of environment they were uh, formed. And if these conditions were habitable and maybe uh, host its uh, biosignature I just uh, detailed. So with all this information, we can try to reconstruct the co-evolution of Earth and life. Uh, Kurt has nicely summarized the evolution, the chemical evolution of Earth, so I don't have to go into the detail of this uh, graph. But basically, we went from anoxic ocean and atmosphere to uh, intermediate stage that was quite long, where the ocean was stratified with only oxygen in shallow water, maybe a little bit in atmosphere, to a fully oxidized atmosphere and ocean colon. And life diversified through these uh, conditions. Also, other geological events uh, as were important, like uh, meteoritic impacts, big glaciations, uh, formation and fragmentation of supercontinents. And through this time, we have fragments of the puzzle of life, and that help us to, to understand how life evolved. So, uh, specifically for this uh, EGU meeting, we have several news. Uh, regarding eukaryotic evolution, uh, we try to document for several years now how eukaryotes appear and evolve uh, on Earth, and we see that they diversified in a quite difficult situation in a chemically stratified ocean where only shallow water was oxygenated. And during this meeting next uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, some students uh, in the lab and uh, postdocs will present first evidence for this eukaryote. Uh, diversification in West and Central Africa. So this is the first comprehensive study of microfossils, chemostratigraphy, and redox conditions for this part of Africa, for the Proterozoic. Cyanobacteria, Kurt already nicely summarized why they are so important. What's the big deal about them? Well, they are the one who invented the photosynthesis that produces oxygen, and they change dramatically Earth's chemistry. And when I say chemistry, it's the ocean, the atmosphere, but also the minerals and the types of rocks that exist. They provided new ecological niches. They are major primary producers. They're also the ancestor of the chloroplasts that we find in algae and plants. So they have an, a profound impact on the diversification of complex life, and not only mobile animals, but also algae and plants. And actually, this complex life might also have a role in the oxygenation of devotion. This is also a new hypothesis. So again, in this meeting, we heard Kurt uh, talking about the new paper by uh, uh, Noah and him and Dan Azel and Tim Lyons. So you can hear about this uh, tomorrow. Uh, we also have, again, evidence for cyanobacteria in this uh, middle proterozoic ocean in Africa. And we also have a, a new paper that's not presented in EGU, but it's uh, coming out in geobiology 
about uh, preservation of, of uh, cyanobacterial mats in modern environment of Antarctica and new signature of these cyanobacteria that we can then look for in uh, early Earth rocks to try to find out really when they appeared. So you see the oldest evidence would be the new evidence that uh, Kurt uh, presented and then there are other microfossil evidence or biomarker evidence that are a bit younger. So coming back to habitability, <laughs> uh, so as I said, tomorrow we have two sessions uh, linking all these topics. Uh, how do we go from the habitability of early Earth to the diversification of life in very different conditions and oxygenation added new niches and new diversity? And then how do we go from what we understand of early Earth and early life to the question of habitability beyond Earth? Well, the classical conditions for habitability that are proposed are the presence of liquid water at the, either at the surface or under the surface, some uh, elements that make up life, energy sources that can be light or uh, electron transfer, exchanges, for example, redox uh, reactions, nutrients. But on Earth, our planet is very special because it's a very geologically active planet. There is a magnetic field. There are all kinds of things that are really particular to Earth, and they might be important for habitability also. So right now, there are different programs and missions that look uh, uh, in ways to, for example, demonstrate the habitability of early Mars. That's what Curiosity is doing. And uh, some results are presented just in the next room here about this. Uh, the future mission ExoMars of ESA will also look at habitability on Mars, but also biosignature. And also, uh, other people are looking for uh, signature habitability on exoplanets, which is another topic. But I will leave uh, Lena to present this. And I just want to finish by saying that all these questions are part of a domain that's called astrobiology, which is the study of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life in the universe. And that uses the knowledge we have of early Earth, early life, and extreme life on Earth to uh, determine where to send missions where to land, which instrument to bring with us, what kind of samples to bring back if we cannot analyze them on Mars, for example, and what kind of signature of habitability and even life to look for beyond the solar system. This is a topic that will be developed in a new big course program of uh, the European Commission, and this will be launched in the middle of May in Brussels. If you are around, please come. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, okay. I will just try to go without a pointer. So if you could just give me okay. you want this? the device. No, on the right side, the device. Yeah. Just. So now we go a little bit away from Earth and look at more exotic uh, worlds, which are called water worlds. So these are possible exoplanets, which are uh, we can see um, <coughs> orbiting around um, stars at, um, in the universe. And um, these water worlds have a very low density, and from our average density, from which we know that there must be a lot of water present at these planets. So the most likely configuration is that um, these planets have a more or less Earth-like um, interior structure, and then above of it, they have a um, deep, very deep ocean, a layer that <coughs> can be water or ice, high-pressure ice, for example, which can be up to, up to hundreds of kilometers depths, or even thousand kilometers of depths, or more. So, if we actually look for life outside of the solar system, we typically um, look at the uh, at the place where um, water can be liquid at the surface. So this defines the habitable zone that you may have already heard about. It depends on the distance to, uh, of a planet to the star. Um, where liquid water at the surface is still possible. Um, so in theory, we assume that um, if we have life at the surface, um, the planet might be habitable. habitable. Um, so just to mention again, I'm not talking about planets that are covered with a thick ice lid um, for several reasons, but one of the reasons is also that it's really, really hard for, for detection of uh, possible life outside of the solar system if the, if a possible life in an ocean is um, shielded from the surface by an ice layer. So we are concentrating only on planets that have uh, water at the surface, so they are therefore in the habitable zone. 
So we know on Earth that water is very important for life. So you could ask if more water is even better for life. And I will hope to convince you that this is not necessarily the case. So let's first look at possible configurations that you can have for water oceans uh, with a liquid um, water layer at the surface. So in the left picture you can see a um, planet with an interior structure similar to Earth and um, on top you'd have a pure water or an entirely liquid um, ocean layer, water ocean layer. The next possible configuration would be like a sandwich layer. So you have uh, liquid water at the surface followed by a high pressure ice layer and um, underneath between um, the ice layer and the silicate mantle is again an, a liquid uh, water layer. But the third possibility would be that um, you have only a water layer on top and the whole rest of, the, of this water ice layer is entirely frozen. It's entirely ice. So, like a, for a cooking recipe for life, what you, what you need is not only water. So what you also need is an energy source. So this can be like, um, we have it at the surface of Earth, solar energy, but it can also be thermal or chemical energy, like you have it, for example, at the ocean floor at hydrothermal vents. Another thing that life needs to uh, for form and also to, f to evolve are minerals um, and the so-called building blocks for life. These can be delivered by impacts, but can also come from the interior of the planet. And they need a place of reaction. So somehow, if you have a big ocean and the nutrients are um, somewhere in the ocean, but um, the energy source is some other place, you will not have a perfect place where life can form. So this all tends to the conclusion that the ocean floor is actually ideal for the origin of life if you have a planet covered by a thick um, ocean layer. So coming back to the three different examples of how an ocean uh, planet can look like, if we look at the um, picture to the right, if you have a frozen layer above the ocean layer, um, the origin of life is really highly unlikely. Um, if you have a liquid layer on top of the, uh, of, the, of the silicate mantle but beneath the ice layer, in principle um, you would have um, or, or the ocean floor would in principle um, be possible a possible origin of life. But the problem is that to actually get this layer you will have very high pressures down there, very high temperatures. So this might as well be a problem. So it's questionable if for such a planet life can actually evolve. So the most likely candidate for habitable ocean planets would be a planet um, this, that is entirely liquid. So the question is, how do you actually get that? For, can you somehow find out which planets are more likely to be in this habitable regime where you have an entirely liquid ocean or not? So this is uh, what we were looking at. So on the one hand, if you would have, for example, a very cold surface temperature, then you will um, get more likely and more easily into a high-pressure ice layer than if you have a high surface temperature. But if your surface temperature is too high, then of course at some point um, the metabolism for life would not work anymore. So the surface temperatures somehow have to be in the intermediate regime. So this is also another reason why planets with a liquid surface might be better candidates if you search for habitable planets. Um, with an ocean than, than if, if they're covered by an ice layer. Then uh, the ocean sickness actually has a strong influence on um, the question if the ocean will be entirely liquid or not. And there we found out that the shell where the ocean is, the more likely it will be entirely liquid. Another factor is the planet size. So to obtain high pressure ice, the pressure from coming from above is very important. And the pressure is influenced by the mass of the planet. So the smaller the planet, the more likely you will have an entirely liquid ocean. Um, so if you want to have more information, more detailed um, summaries, also about geophysics at the ocean floor, I would highly invite you to visit my PICO presentation tomorrow, because it's PICO Screen Suite, you can then discuss for one hour with um, seven more information this topic. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentations. We'll now open the floor for questions.
Are there any questions here? Holger Kroker, freelance from Germany. Uh, Professor Javot, can I ask you for a comment on the uh, line of evidence uh, Professor Kohnhauser presented us for uh, the early cyanobacteria? What do you think about this? <laughs> Well, I'm not a geochemist, <laughs> but I think it goes into the, the same line as other previous evidence, maybe less direct evidence. There are, there are already some suggestions by other uh, scientists that cyanobacteria probably appear earlier than the Great Oxidation Event, because the Great Oxidation Event is 2.4 billion years ago, so more or less, and it's a planetary scale effect, so they must have appeared before. Um, this is really a global effect. So the new uh, tools they, that uh, Kurt and his team developed is really interesting. Uh, and I think it's, it's really possible that there was some oxygenation in the water, uh, not necessarily on a global scale in the atmosphere, but oxygenation must have started close to cyanobacterial mats in shallow water where they live before it expands to the, the whole planet. So the, the thing is, uh, uh, maybe Kurt can probably answer better than me, is it a local signal or a global signal, uh, even in water, in the co water column? Um, otherwise, uh, beside this, this uh, new evidence, there is a, a suggestion that big uh, black shale deposits at 3.2 billion years ago uh, were probably uh, originated by uh, mass deposition of organic matters may be produced by cyanobacteria. There are some big fossils around 3.2 billion years uh, old uh, rock in Africa that uh, we discovered, and we don't know what they are, but they are big, so maybe some cyanobacteria, we don't know, but we don't have any evidence for oxygenation at that time. So I think several people are going different ways to the, to the same conclusion that oxygenation must have started way before the Great Oxidation event. Um, I don't know if you want to add. No, I, 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 I think you're absolutely right. The distinction with, with our paper is that this is probably a very localized signature. So at that particular spot, there was some local oxygen production. Nothing to do with the global scale. We're not arguing that this is atmospheric oxygen. So I think, you know, they started probably in pockets in different environments. But by the time you get to 2.5, 2.4, there was enough cyanobacteria production of O2 that there's a global signature than in the atmosphere. Mm. But one of the points with our paper and other papers is the problem is there's no smoking gun. You're not going to find that perfect fossil that's clearly cyanobacteria that you can say, okay, there he is. Because, you know, with the problem with microfossils, you know, a lot of things might look the same. They don't preserve particularly well. So we're really stuck with indirect pieces of evidence. So what we're really looking for is what do cyanobacteria do? Well, they produce oxygen. What does oxygen do around in its environment? Well, it oxidizes various different minerals and metals. So that's the type of signatures we're trying to look for. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <coughs> I'm Simon Redfern. I'm um, working for the BBC here. And uh, following your, both of your comments just then on, on where these cyanobacteria were, is there a link between what was happening at this great oxidation event and the development of shallow seas or any tectonic sort of origins for, for why the environment was uh, suitable for, for cyanobacteria to thrive at that time? I can, um, yeah, there certainly is a time when, when the continents start getting bigger, you start getting continental shelves, and suddenly you have a habitat that's amenable to you know, large scale cyanobacteria production, stromatolite production. And there's no doubt at that point in time you're probably producing excess amount of oxygen. The time we're looking at, although these are shallow deposits, there wasn't a lot of continental shelves at that time. So we're pretty much stuck with these localized type of environments. But clearly there is, there is a, a major, it's not a coincidence that at 2.5, this great oxidation event, is also a time when the continents are getting bigger, you get the continental shelves. So a lot of things are coming into play at the same time. It's kind of like the perfect storm for oxygen to accumulate in the atmosphere. But, you know, like you said, that's the perfect storm. But before you get to that point, you have to start it somewhere. And that's what we're trying to really kind of find out when and where. Yeah, can I add to this? Uh, but the shallow water habitat existed earlier than this. We have a geological evidence at already at 3.5 billion years ago that there are something called, uh, described as traumatolites. There are shallow water evidence in, in the rocks, in the sediments. 
But of course, cyanobacteria are very complex bacteria. So this is also a significant uh, indirect result. If cyanobacteria were there three billion years ago, that means you know, the diversification of bacteria already occurred before. So life is, again, much older than this. And, uh, and life could use photosynthesis much before this oxygen photosynthesis, which is complex, maybe at 3.4 billion years ago. We are not sure, but some, some evidence point to that. So. Thank you. Any other questions? No? If there aren't, we'll finish here. You are welcome to approach our panelists, as always. And thank you all. This is our last pre press conference, so thank you all very much for coming. Um, and uh, we are done here at the Press Center for today, but there is a geoengineering great debate you might be interested in at 3.30 in room Y1. And I hope to see you all next year from the 12th to the 17th of April here in Vienna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.